All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, this is a special volunteer orientation for uh, the fall season. Uh, my name is Erwin Ostidi. I'm the president of the board of directors of the Wild Bird Trust of BC. And want to welcome you to this uh, special orientation. Uh, it's a beautiful sunny day. And uh, we recognize though that a lot of folks watch our events online. And uh, so while we're a, a, a modest group today, um, and we'll be uh, having a special presentation from, from Marissa Bischoff, um, our assistant site and restoration manager. We uh, will also have an opportunity for question and answers afterwards. Um, but also we welcome you to share this video from our Facebook feed uh, to your friends and your family. And we end up getting a lot of extra viewers um, that way as well as a form of outreach. So uh, our work is, uh, provincially focused and locally focused and provincially we focus uh, through our wingspan magazine on advocacy around uh, wild birds in British Columbia we also look at the issue of uh, the intersectional issues of reconciliation and conservation place-based in the broad inlet we have the responsibility of caretaking the conservation area at Maplewood Flats and in, and in that space we're uh, indebted and um, very much aware of the fact that the land that we've been caretaking for 20 almost 28 years uh, that 28 years represents just a, a fraction of one percent of the history that the Tsleil-Waututh have been uh, stewarding that land so that um, we have some considerable humility when we recognize the kind of proportion proportionality of that that in fact we've been here for very very brief moment of time and uh, and we're very much committed to uh, unlearning some of the colonial ways that we've been ma uh, managing the site uh, and frankly excluding the Slavita from their traditional lands. And I couldn't be more frank than that. Uh, so we uh, acknowledge that it is unceded lands from the Slavita and Coast Salish people. The Skohomish also had a village site just over by Seymour River. And of course, all the lands and waters were shared with the Musqueam. Uh, if you go towards Port Moody, uh, the end of Burrard Inlet, shared with the Quiquetlam and the Kate Sea. And so that's the history we uh, have, um, but it's also not a historical relic. It's also the contemporary reality. And we're really excited about the amazing conservation um, and ecological pr protection work that the Slavitov do for us uh, at Maplewood Flats in terms of the work, the cumulative work that's being done to protect Burrard Inlet, the water quality, the bird habitat uh, really uh, want to recognize Slavita's leadership in the Treaty Lands and Resources Department for, for all the work that they're doing. So without any further ado, we'll pass the hat uh, over to Marissa, who will be uh, presenting, and I'll, I'll be sticking around in the background and welcome any questions after Marissa's presentation. Great. Thank you, Erin. Yeah. So we'll go to, right into it, and we'll start uh, with uh, a roadmap so we know where we are and where we're going. And we'll begin with a brief history of the Maplewood Flats area and the formation of the Wild Bird Trust and all the industry and all of that's gone into where we are today. And then we'll talk about the values that make up this or organization, uh, like what's our mission and maybe you share some of these values. And then we'll discuss reasons to volunteer with us and then the different volunteer roles. Uh, and then I'll move on just to uh, different ways you can become involved as we'll talk about volunteers, kind of a term we're trying to, we're trying to figure out for, for us at the organization. And then at the end, like Erwin mentioned, we'll take some questions, but feel free to pop in any of your questions in the chat if you have any in the interim. And we'll get going. So I wanted to include this kind of photograph, or aerial photograph of the Maplewood Flats area. It's the early, earliest one I could find of 1926, just to kind of compare it to what, what it was even within the same century. Um, and it's obviously going to be more developed now, 30 years later. And we say that Maplewood Flats has the last piece of salt marsh habitat on, in the Broad Inlet but really it's just a small portion of what it was and well what we wish it could still be 
Erwin mentioned this a little bit, but uh, Coast Salish people, they lived successfully and sustainably on this land for more than 13,000 years prior to settler contact by various ways like hunting, gathering, um, growing, uh, cultivating, and trading resources. And then at around 1859, um, some arbitrary exclusionary lines started to be drawn on British or Western maps. And obviously um, this has had some consequences for First Nations people locally um, and pretty much all over North America. Uh, since then, and we see the echoes of this to this day, um, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of this. And if you're interested in learning more about the history of Indigenous peoples, at least locally, I highly recommend the Indigenous History and Burnaby Resource Guide. It won an award this year uh, for outstanding educational achievement. So take a look at that if you're interested. And then in the early 1900s, as it was kind of the name of the game, forestry, uh, there was extensive logging of the forest surrounding Burrard Inlet, including in Maplewood Flats, and it began to pick up and it would be common to see large log booms such as this out on the, out on the water and um, uh, historical relics of these log booms remain to this day in the form of these uh, sort of vertical pilings you see there which now serve as mounting posts or we also call them dolphins um, for over a hundred uh, nest boxes that we put up for purple martin purple martins that return each spring so it's it has uses uh, in these modern times and then in the mid 20th century, uh, a sand and gravel company ran a mill and extracted gravel in the Maple Flats area and across Dollarton Highway. You see this kind of blown up grainy photo I wanted to include just because um, I had this cool thing here, which is um, when you come to the to Maple Flats, you'll likely cross a bridge to get out over onto the west side. And underneath that bridge is a channel of water. And what you might not realize is that channel was built during this era in order to transport the extracted gravel and sand from the mining pits. And so we call that the barge channel now. And this picture is kind of just looking over into Burrard Inlet from um, Dollarton Highway. So it's pretty interesting. And then since the late 1800s, a range of working class people from artists to industry workers that were unable to afford expensive housing actually started to build and live in these uh, squatter shacks, squatter shacks, excuse me, not unlike this one, among the mud flats in Burrard Inlet and in front of, in front of uh, Maplewood Flats. And the intertidal was a bit of a jurisdictional gray area, which allowed them to do this for quite a few years. But then in 1971, the District of North Vancouver started to burn down the last shacks in Burrard Inlet after receiving numerous complaints over the years from local residents. Um, today, uh, you can see an artistic homage of these squatter shacks. Um, it's called From Shangri-La to Shangri-La by Ken Lum, which are replicas that are now installed in the barge channel at Maplewood Flats. And if anyone is interested in this uh, kind of piece of history of Maplewood Flats. You can look up uh, this documentary called uh, um, Mud Flats Living. Mud Flats Living uh, looks more in depth into this era. All right, so some other industrial activities in and around uh, Maplewood Flats included use as a trucking depot, a dredging of the marshes on the south side of the sites um, for an unrealized seaport, but um, the dredged area still is there to this day. And Maplewood Flats was also used as a dumping site for all sorts of construction uh, debris, like pavement, concrete, metal, etc., and um, garden soils. And if you have an eye out and you're, you're looking at the beaches, um, you can actually still see some of this debris poking out. So it's, uh, it's very obviously a post-industrial site if you know how and where to look, but yeah, in 1993, the uh, community and local environmental groups were successful in uh, lobbying the District of North Vancouver to designate the site as a conservation area. And then the beginnings of the Wild Bird Trust is formed. And just a quick note about 
the jurisdiction of the site is kind of convoluted, or I should say uh, more complicated. It's the land owned, at least in the settler sense, by the District of North Vancouver and the Port of Vancouver, who leased the sites to Environment and Climate Change Canada, who actually have a, uh, a building in Maplewood Flats. If you've been there before, it's kind of right across the parking lot, the Pacific uh, Envi Environmental Sciences Centre. Um, and they have an agreement with us, the Wild Bird Trust, to manage the site. And that lease, I believe, uh, is good until uh, 2041. And so the landscape, as we've kind of under, as we've gone through all this history, obviously it's it would have been so much different just 50 years ago, and there's been a massive regrowth and of plant life, both aided, like from planting or natural regenerations. So a lot of people would say it's pristine nature, but we want to be careful in how we use language because the history of the site has seen a lot in, industrially. And um, we we want to make sure we know we we know the history and we're aware that there's been lots and historical and continued uh, First Nations presence, but also a lot of damage over the years. Okay, so we'll continue. Over the years, the Wild Bird Trust has added infrastructure to the conserva conservation area, including a bridge over that barge channel we just spoke about to provide access to the western side of the flat, Maplewood Flats uh, terrestrial up, up, upland area. There has been a greeter hut uh, built at the entrance to the site. There's the Wild Bird Trust native plant nursery that um, kind of now serves as a source of funds to fulfill our mission. And we'll talk about this more later, actually. And then, of course, there's the Corgan Nature House, which has a large meeting space that we can use to facilitate aspects of our mission, like nature education, programs for kids, art and cultural exhibits, um, educational presentations, something like this, if we're in person, and event hosting. And if you didn't know, and um, the Nature House is available for event booking, so you can keep in for any of your events. All right. And just one note about the Nature House is that it was opened in March 2015, so it's relatively new, and it was made possible with the support of the Norbury Foundation, uh, Doris and Jack Corrigan, and many other generous donors. One other addition to the flats uh, that I wanted to mention as well is a series of constructed wetlands that were built, I believe, in the 90s, uh, as well as a, a groundwater pump that, would su that supplies those wetlands with fresh water, groundwater. Okay, so that's a lot of what the Midfield Flats is right now and how it came to be. But um, in recent years, the Wild Bird Trust has acknowledged that in the formation of Maplewood Flats as the conservation area was the inherent and continued exclusion of the Tsleil Waututh Nation from their traditional lands and waters, as Erwin mentioned at the top. And the organization is now trying to take steps to move forward in reconciliation and redress. And currently, and we have been and we currently are working with the Tsleil Waututh Nation through their Treaty Lands and Resources Department to work on a protocol agreement and an alignment of joint interests in order to form Maplewood Flats for the future. All right. Um, if everything's good, we'll keep going on. So we'll go over a little bit of the values of the Wild Bird Trust, uh, which pretty neatly surmised by our mission statement, which is to provide wild birds with sanctuary through ecological protection and restoration and to support communities with education, culture, and reconciliation programs. So conservation and habitat restoration. It's an ongoing commitment for the Wild Bird Trust, of course, um, and there are many ways in which we approach conservation in Maplewood Flats. Um, some of that includes invasive plant management through activities like plant pulls. For example, on the picture uh, on the left there, you can see some staff and volunteers testing out a method of eradicating yellow flag iris and we've actually um, had a workshop this summer in August with an expert and she came and um, showed us how to do a larger area and so we're, we're excited to see the results next summer 
And then we also carry out regular native vegetation plantings. So invasive poles and plantings are things that our volunteers are essential um, for. Um, so if you're interested in that sort of thing, please reach out. We also conduct regular um, and consistent bird surveys. And we provide opportunities for researchers to conduct studies. For example, in the picture on the right, there are some BCIT students conducting some water tests for a year long research, research project. And actually this, just this summer, uh, a student from Capilano University was conducting surveys on macroinvertebrates in our wetlands. And he actually presented his, some of his findings at, in a pre presentation a week ago or something like that. It's very interesting. Okay, and then on to education. So utilizing the natural environment we have at Maplewood Flats and the infrastructure allows us to provide our community with educational content about conservation issues, indigenous knowledge, and workshops. We offer events such as bird walks, lectures, presentations, and nature education programs for children. And uh, the photo on the right is of, is of our uh, summer staff member, Sinakola Wiss. And she regularly uh, would lead indigenous plant walks um, throughout the site. And then another uh, way we can kind of connect with members and the public is in spreading awareness of local issues is through the semi-annual public publication Wingspan, which is sent to all members at no additional charge. And then culture. It's, of course, an important aspect of building a sense of belonging and community. And the Wild Bird Trust consider, considers art to be an important sort of expression of historical, social, and environmental issues. Art and photography exhibits are regularly displayed uh, within the nature house. And there's also actually some permanent uh, um, pieces that, art pieces that can be found throughout the conservation area, like the ones you see in the middle and the right there. Additionally, every year, the Wild Bird Trust organizes and hosts the Osprey Festival, an event celebrating community, conservation, um, and art, while honoring Coast Salish um, land and peoples. Obviously, with the COVID complications this year, we weren't able to run uh, the Osprey Festival this summer, unfortunately, but we are already uh, thinking about next this, this next year. So hopefully um, things settle down where we can hold one again. Okay. Oh. Okay. And uh, so reconciliation or reconciliation is a term that implies that there was a good relationship to begin with. Again, like Erwin sort of alluded to at the top there. At the Wild Bird Trust, the board is assuming a more proactive stance in terms of committing to real action um, to repair these past mistakes and to move forward with some honesty and humility to build a more co collaborative working relationship with the Slave Tooth uh, Nation and other Coast Salish peoples who are, um, like you said, the original and ongoing stewards of these lands and waters. And it is our intention through the work of repair, this repair, this work of repair and redress to kind of ensure things shift so that members of the Slave Tooth community um, can actively use and view this site as their, their own, as this has been disruptive, disrupted and actively denied for the past 30 years since the formation of um, the, the Wild Bird Trust. And I just wanted to note, um, Again, um, I'm sure you've noticed that reconciliation is kind of a theme that's been sort of threaded through all of these values. And as the Wild Bird Trust has kind of transformed in the last few years, um, we're trying to, instead of pushing reconciliation into its own corner and just treating it as a separate entity that we need to deal with, we want to incorporate this reconciliation as into all of these values to create a kind of a holistic approach to it which is really the only way I think um, that you really can. All right. And so if you are excited about the values that we just spoke about um, and how we're fulfilling them, I'm sure you're anxious to know how to become a volunteer. And kind of the first thing is that you need to become a member. Now, uh, we have, I've had lots of discussions with Erwin about how the, the term volunteer is um, problematic in that it kind of invokes this sense of hierarchy. 
but at the Wild Bird Trust, we're, we're trying to move into a more um, participatory, uh, demogra uh, democratic uh, system where everyone is kind of member, active participant. So everyone's a collaborator and everyone has the same amount of uh, power in providing their opinions and skills. So if you have a skill set, then you, we can use it collaboratively. And if you have another organization with you think that you can make a partnership with us for a mutually beneficial result, that's great. So there's more than one way to really uh, be involved or besides simply being like uh, an on-site volunteer, which is also very important. Okay. So another benefits of becoming a member is that you will get a wingspan, a copy of a wingspan, wingspan magazine for each publication. You'll get reduced pricing on workshops and events, and you would materially support the work we do in conservation, education, culture, and reconciliation that directly uh, affects the community. And most importantly, in terms of the presentation, this presentation, it gives you the opportunity to do this work with us. Okay, but what can you gain by being a volunteer? I know uh, everyone has a different idea of being a volunteer or what, what you'll gain from being a volunteer, but uh, the main things uh, we believe is that you be can become an integral part of the local nonprofit and can contribute to building the organization and, and um, achieving our goals. You'll gain experience and knowledge and conservation, um, interacting and communicating with the public. And you can exemplify the values of the Wild Bird Trust that we just kind of went over. You can build meaningful relationships with like-minded people. And for those uh, probably more younger volunteers, uh, we can get a reference letter after 30 hours of volunteer work over three months. If this is something you're interested in, uh, a reference letter, uh, the person to get in touch with would be me, myself. Uh, I'll provide an email address at the end for everybody who's interested in volunteering and for the diff different types of volunteering you're interested in. And finally, of course, the catch-all, everybody wants to have fun, right? So when we're working hard, we're having fun, we're achieving these shared values and yeah. So next, I'll be going over some of the many different ways you can dedicate your time and efforts as an active participant with the Wild Bird Trust. And kind of at the top um, is the board of directors. They're also volunteers. So like I mentioned, every volunteer uh, has the same amount of power. But if you want to have um, more influence in the, the growth or the direction the organization goes to, you would probably be best put into uh, a committee. And we'll talk about committees in a second. And then the third kind of uh, group of volunteers that we have is sort of the regular volunteers, sort of uh, on-site volunteering, where you, you come in and you, you do uh, like maintenance work or hosting, that sort of thing. So for the committees, oh, the other thing about the board of directors is that um, they, they're kind of the, the body that oversees the kind of steering of the organization and they oversee, they oversee the committees, uh, the finances, the staffing, and the, op and the overall operations of the Wild Bird Trust. So that's all you need to know about that right now. <laughs> okay, so committees meet one to two times a month and are mainly um, involved in the organizational planning of the Wild Bird Trust activities and events. And so for the first uh, committee here is the programs committee. And uh, when you're a part of this committee, you can help plan and develop for programs that relate to the mandate, including educational programs, um, schools like school programs and nature walks, interpretive displays, panels or symposiums, speaker series, uh, and cultural programs like literary events, exhibits, public art commissions and publications. Next, the next uh, committee is the communications committee which manages and plans for our social media profiles. So shameless plug there, <laughs> if you aren't following us already, um, our Instagram, uh, Facebook, and uh, Twitter profiles, at Maplewood Flats. 
and they build and maintain our website, the, the communications committee, and they help um, with our Wingspan magazine. In fact, they have uh, a working group that works on the Wingspan magazine. So if you're interested in, say, um, publication or writing, uh, and but you're not interested in anything else, um, you could just join the working group and that can be your contribution. Um, they also deal with tra trail si signage, excuse me, and media releases. And the next committee is the Habitat Committee, uh, which develops our habitat and cultural use plan and helps plan for restoration projects, site maintenance, uh, birding and ecological research projects, and uh, the Coast Salish Plant Nursery. And last but not least is the Fundraising Committee. It uh, helps with grant writing, um, special events, donor relationships, and uh, the bench program. So if you have any like special skills that you think would fall into any of these committees and you have the time and the energy to commit, I highly recommend you get in, in touch with me um, to learn more about how you can join. All right, so now we'll go into some of the more regular on the ground uh, positions that are more regular. So the first one here is our site maintenance and habitat restoration volunteer position whose main duties include planting and promoting the growth of native vegetation, uh, performing trail maintenance, which entails keeping trails clear of debris, cutting back encroaching plants and helping with trail repair, invasive plant control, or removal and promoting promoting uh, habitat feeders for native species. Also, you can have the chance to improve your plant ID skills, and um, even if you have handy person skills, this is a great position for you as well. And we always could use more help um, and people power in this in in this position. All right. So the next position are exhibit interpreters who support visitor access engagement with exhibits and educational displays. You can help to host event guests and you'll be responsible for uh, opening and locking up after finishing uh, your evening shifts. Um, mm -hmm. Daytime and or evenings availability for that right now. The next position is the trail host. Um, you'll walk the trail in pairs to interact with the public. You'll respond to questions from visitors and share resources about birds and wildlife when possible. You can also, uh, you'll also act sort of as an extra set of ears and eyes along the trails to monitor for safety con concerns, um, trail conditions like fallen trees that need to be moved, etc. And in the uh, incidents or activities that might require special attention. Uh, one um, caveat for this position is that you will have to be able to walk the trails easily. All right, and the next position is the nature house host. Uh, you'll be there to greet or welcome visitors as they enter the site. You can hand out the Wingspan magazine and maps, and you'll try to receive donations and promote membership, membership sales, excuse me. Um, right now, we're kind of just starting up the, the greeter role here but it's very tentatively um, because of the COVID um, restrictions and uh, like all for most of these positions we're kind of uh, still tentatively looking at um, reopening I should say or reinitiating them because um, we're concerned um, just with talking to the public for which, which, which a lot of these positions require but as soon as we have sort of a protocol in dealing with the COVID restrictions, we're hoping to restart a lot of these positions and then letting our volunteers, our members know that they can start uh, volunteering again. So next, um, we had uh, open social media community manager, but we are just in the process of hiring actually um, a staff member that we got funds for. So right now we're, we're closing that volunteer opportunity for the moment um, that may reopen again in the future. And then next, of course, we have our Coast Salish plant nursery posi like position. Uh, you can help plant with sales, uh, plant sales and education uh, 
educating the public of native plants, with, about native plants, sorry. You'll tend to the plants and you contribute to nursery outreach and development. And they're just closing up, this is a seasonal position, they're just kind of closing up their, um, intermittent kind of uh, volunteer opportunities throughout the fall and winter, I think I've, I've heard. Um, but I'll, if you sign up to be a volunteer, I'll keep you updated if you're interested in, in this position. Another aspect of the plant nursery is the, the nursery growth projects. Um, there's been a lot of work going into it, going into the nursery growth project. So next year, the nursery itself will be um, will be different than it was uh, this summer. We're also working on a demonstration garden of uh, Coast Salish native plants that we're kind of collaborating with the Slave Tooth Nation and contractors on, and we will be needing some help from volunteers in terms of planting when as that comes to fruition and i believe that will be done in the next year so yeah next position are data entry volunteers so their main duties will be entering um kind of monthly bird survey data onto i, I what, whether that be ebird the citizen science platform we're kind of looking at our data entry pro, uh, protocols right now um, but of course, we'll keep our volunteers up to date on th that practice. And then the archivists will be focused on records management and digitizing physical file files. Um, we have, I believe, a closet full of old um, physical files that we that need to be gone through. And any kind of help we can get in kind of tackling that would be greatly appreciated. Appreciated, as I understand. All right, so that's kind of the end of the regular volunteer roles, but uh, from time to time there might be call outs sent to our members for volunteers with specific skills, like I mentioned. And there are other uh, volunteer opportunities like the monthly bird surveys. Um, the monthly bird surveys right now, they used to be um, like, a, like a group of people could come out and do the bird surveys together. But um, right now we're just doing a few people, um, keeping in mind uh, COVID. Uh, distancing and um, restrictions um, but like I said um, we keep we'll keep our members updated on what's going on with that as time goes on there's also working groups that you can be a part of like I mentioned earlier um, the wingspan uh, editorial um, lots of work goes into this it details what's going on at the flats and we're trying to Provincially now we're trying to have a greater presence in the conservation uh, conversation. But if you're interested in just certain things and working groups within committees, you can just dedicate your time to those working groups. Um, that's your prerogative and the beauty of having control over yourself and as a member, active participant of the organization. And then finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Purple Martin S box set up, take down and inspections. Um, it's a program that's been around since the early 90s. Um, we're, we're proud of our role and the recovery of local Purple Martin um, population, population recoveries, yeah. However, we also recognize that it, it's weird. It was a bit odd to find some pride in that while also like again, excluding the Tsleil-Waututh Youth Nation in um, involvement or consultation in the program. So we're, act we're in conversation and about including more Tsleil-Waututh Youth involvement and even giving them ownership over it. So it's not just a wild bird trust initiative. All right, so in conclusion, we're at the end. Um, what have we learned? So the Maplewood Flats is a post-industrial site with a very complicated history as we've learned. There's been numerous industrial operations, um, colonial takeover and um, continued um, sort of op operations of the site in a colonial way to modern times. 
And now with the transformation of the organization, we're trying to look into a future that's more collaborative with the Tsleil-Waututh Nation and other Coast Salish peoples. We've learned, yeah, so basically we've, we've learned to, we're learning to, um, we're looking to transform our operations to be more, to be more um, decolonial. And then finally, we've talked about the many and varied ways that you can become involved as active participants and collaborators. And I just wanted to thank you all for, for coming here and being interested. And um, hopefully you can, if you have the time and the inclination, you can email me. This will be me answering these emails. The email to, so I can access it. So I'll be replying to all your emails uh, if you're interested. Uh, volunteer at wildbirdtrust.org. Um, the other thing is, please include uh, about any questions about membership. Uh, if you're interested, this is a membership cost, but uh, I'll throw it down out to you guys for any questions, and I'll kind of peruse the chat to see if anybody left any questions in the meantime. All right, so yeah, thank you guys. <laughs> so oh, lots in the chat. Okay, thank you, Shani Noble, for providing the Mud Flats Living um, link in the chat. Well, the cat, un <clears throat> university students present. Go ahead, Erwin, please. <laughs> or did I hear Leanne or? I, oh, I was in? just going to say that looks like there's some folks in the in the Zoom who've, who've been volunteering, working with us actively. Um, so it's nice to have a, a mix of folks who could share, you know, what they've been interested in in um, doing. And but uh, yeah, like to listen to some new people. Any questions? So Catherine asked if Harrison's presentation was recorded. It has been recorded and um, it should be on our Facebook page as a recorded event. And if you have access to YouTube, um, if you go to the Maplewood Flats um, YouTube uh, page, the recording will be there too. I believe all, all of our uh, online programming since early, so this early summer has been recorded and uploaded onto YouTube. So you have access to those. Yeah. Since and Earth Day. <laughs> Earth Day. Yeah. And yeah. You. So, okay. Mm -hmm. How many volunteers do we currently have? And what, what roles do we really need help with? Um, Leanne, do you have a uh, kind of ballpark idea of how many volunteers we have? I would say... I know, 40, 40? Yeah, 30 to 40. Okay. Yeah. Include the, bo include the board and... members. It's. Um, I would say that I, I'll just jump in. I, I wanted to add a few thoughts to um, Marissa's presentation. And um, no, no, Heidi, we don't wind down during the winter. In fact, we actually speed up because uh, when the bird nesting season is not upon us, we can do more uh, um, aggressive uh, removal of invasive plants and, and do more work actually in the winter time. Um, but I think I just want to echo the, the fact that Marissa talked about, and, and I've spoken with some of you directly. Um, I know Darcy's on the call there and I've, I've, we had a chat this week. Um, you know, I can't say enough how much we've really, um, you know, like Leanne, Leanne Payne, our executive director and myself, we, we've got, um, 30 years experience doing community-based uh, nonprofit organizing and um, cultural cultural work, uh, public programming work. So, uh, and there's Elsie there on the, on the screen as well with Leanne. Elsie's our office administrator. Um, the, um, so we bring, you know, when, when, we, uh, when we assumed responsibility for the organization in 2016, we really inherited an organization that was very much focused on itself um, I remember walking into the, the the first AGM that I walked into in 2016, and there was a room with 80 people, and 79 out of the 80 people were visibly white, and there was one 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 woman of Asian ancestry, and it really struck me how strange that was. That in our in this day and age, um, 
that that was still happening, that there was this conservation organization that was very white and, um, and, and had a um, certain practice of, of operating and was very much in opposition to what Slavotuth was, was doing. And um, so we've made a, a we've, you know, we're, we're not shy about that change that we've made. Um, we've, um, we've done, we've done the changes deliberately because we feel like the organization in the past prior to 2016 didn't reflect the people that use the site. It didn't reflect broader society. Uh, and, and in fact, it didn't even reflect our mandate as an organization. Um, we were very, we were just, um, crawling along on our mandate and we failed to even engage the Slavotuth who are our neighbors who are actually doing far more for our own mandate. So um, pragmatically, uh, ethically, there's a lot of reasons why we've changed the organization. And I would say that what we have now is a platform. And I just wanna invite folks, I think Marissa alluded to it, but I really wanna reinforce the point. Yes, there's these key volunteer roles, there's these jobs that we all do. I happen to be the chair of the board. Um, I give about 20 to 30 hours a week um, in helping kind of the management of the organization as a volunteer. Um, but it might be that someone wants to come in and do curating or someone wants to be a writer. Uh, so you don't need to be an ecological restoration expert. Um, you can have a particular passion that you bring to it. So we really built a platform for uh, reconciliation, redress and conservation work. Uh, some of us are birders, some of us are not birders. So we really welcome you um, and, and don't feel like you've got to slot into a particular role. I think Marissa is very adaptive to hearing what your interest it is, what your interest is. Our programs committee has a call for proposals coming out in about two weeks. And that will really set the stage for 2021 to say, do you want to be, do you want to do a book club? Do you want to do, um, do you want to be a writer in residence? Do you want to um, work on a restoration project? Um, Marissa talked about the, the, uh, the demonstration garden. That is a, uh, um, it is tentatively going to be honoring uh, a Slavotuth member who passed away recently uh, because that, 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 that individual, Leonard George, uh, if you watch the Mudflats Living film from 1971, he, he's on there, that's 50 years ago, talking about how it would be good if that land, the land of Maplewood Flats, was actually Indigenous land uh, and was protected. And we didn't do that. In fact, we took the land again away from the Slautov and made it a bird sanctuary. So that was 50 years ago. And so now we're repairing that relationship and working with the family. Um, and so that's a project that we'd welcome folks to, to be involved in. So, um, and then we're looking at the Barge Channel and we're putting in a grant to the Heritage BC. You know, Heritage BC is typically like white settler colonial history. So we're going to disrupt that. We want to look at how did the Barge Channel actually harm the Slayotuf? How did it change the landscape? And how can we repair the landscape? So how can we not just do ecological restoration of the Barge Channel, but actually how can the Barge Channel restoration be a point where North Vancouver and, and people who visit actually get to learn and rethink their relationship to history? And that history isn't just something relic of the past, but in fact, it's something that's active today. So the plant material, the way that the plants are used by Slayotuf, is just as relevant as it was a thousand years ago as it is in, in 10 years into the future. And um, so those are some ways that we think about the work and um, the Nature House, uh, as Marissa said, the Nature House is a, an open platform as well. We welcome folks to be involved in that. Um, we're, we're growing quickly. We welcome people who have ideas to help us grow. Um, our budget mostly goes to staffing. Um, four years ago, we had no online presence, no Facebook, uh, no social media. We had a we had a website. Now we have a few thousand people on our social media. Um, on Sunday, last Sunday, I hosted an event with a birder, with a, a naturalist in in southern Iran. She was on the Zoom from Iran. I don't even think that's legal, but anyway, <laughs> there she was. And um, that video has had more than two thousand views this week. And and now we're talking about having a sister relationship between that that marsh area in Iran with Maplewood Flats. And that's important because we want the Iranians, the Iranian community in Vancouver and North Vancouver, which is the second largest expat Iranian population in the world after Los Angeles, we want them to feel an identity to Maplewood Flats. 
and we want to give it, give them a space to learn about colonialism and history of the place that they live in North Vancouver. So that's why we organized an event on birding and Iran because we wanted that community to feel connection to us. Um, so and have that door opening so that they can join us and, and do work with us. So those are some of the thoughts I have and um, just really want to emphasize that point about being a platform and welcoming people's ideas. Yeah, thank you for adding that Erwin. Yeah, I don't know how successful I was in, in addressing that, but that was very, very helpful. Yeah. Um, Alyssa, does that does that answer your question as well? Um, I think um, it definitely did a large part. Thank you so much for um, elaborating on that. Um, I'm still really curious about um, hearing more about what Slavo Tooth Nation has said they want for the land and the area and for future um, collaboration with Wild Bird Trust. Like, do they want, um, or like, is the goal to move to full, like, jurisdiction of the land, like, moving that to Slavo Tooth Nation? There's, um, that's uh, a complicated question uh, with a complicated answer that would probably take a, an hour or two to unpack. But um, the short of that would be that it's not up to us to decide what Slavo to wish or want, et cetera. Um, and in fact, um, Slavo to are tapped and have lots of things going on. Um, and, and they've never asked us to say, hey, we, we want to run a a white birding sanctuary uh, on the shores of our lands. So it's really um, what we're doing is um, we aspire. I mean, we are negotiating right now a protocol agreement. So that that's likely to happen in the next two months. And we'll have a report back to, to our AGM. So anyone who attends our AGM, which will be cool. It'll be in a couple of months. We'll have some guest speakers and discuss that. But um, we, we do believe like um, while I speak hesitantly about it, I can also say like, uh, having been, having worked for Slavototh and, and, and having relationships with Slavototh and identifying as a Slavototh community member, um, we can look at Weawachin. In 1995, Weawachin, just down the water, like three kilometers to the east, Weawachin um, in 1995 was the first co-management agreement between a municip municipality and the First Nation of BC. So that was the slow to joining with the District of North Vancouver to co-manage Weawich and Cates Park. And so we know there's precedence on the waterfront, but we also recognize that the slow to are converting the lands across the road from us on Dollarton Highway to reserve lands. And that's just in process and that'll be developed for housing. So that's happening. Um, so there's, there's those major, major moving parts. We also recognize that our landlords are you know, are represent colonial jurisdictions. And so when we, um, I, when I went to my first steering committee meeting, which is our, essentially the management team that we report to, three years ago, I said, well, why isn't Slavotov here? Um, well, three years later, just this past week, Leanne and I had a meeting and, um, and the Slavotov are being invited by our colonial landlords to join that steering committee. But I, but I assume that in five or 10 years into the future, Slavototh would, would be outright, it might be, that they might be outright treaty, uh, sorry, um, title holders of, of the Maplewood Flats. It's, it's just, that's just the way that, that history is being addressed. Um, Stanley Park is being discussed right now with the co-management agreement between three the nations and the Parks Board. Frankly, the, the three nations may, may co-manage the entire port of Vancouver. We don't know that, but so those are big moves in the future, but all all our indications, our indications of success of the relationship are, for example, that we want children from Slota, the community, to, to grow up feeling an identity to Maplewood Flats, that it is their space. And um, I'm really pleased to see last night uh, on Instagram, uh, our friend Gabe George and Chief Leah uh, Wilson, George Wilson um, having a ceremony for the first outdoor school from Slota given COVID that it's impacted their education program. And uh, Leanne and I reached out to Slavototh a few weeks ago saying, please consider using Maplewood as a site for your children's education program, your outdoor school program. So, so our, our measure of success of having children going up, identifying with Maplewood is actually getting fast track now um, because their, their children's school program will actually be using the site 
uh, for outdoor education. So it's that step by step by step by step normalizing the relationship. So it's really about normalizing the relationship, if I could answer it in that way. Yeah, thanks so much. Are there any and other? We, and, we, and we welcome, like, if, if that, if that, Melissa, if that question interests you, and I know it interests some other folks on the call, um, that's, you know, we're looking for people who really have a passion for that redress work. Like, we're not doing reconciliation work. Uh, folks have heard me talk probably about that, how, you know, reconciliation, to quote Pam Palmer, reconciliation is fluff. It's, you know, we could be doing reconciliation for decades and, and really very little will change. So it re it's really about redress. And so we're building a site where we can advance the goals of protecting wildlife and recognizing that redress can be done at the same time. And so if you're passionate about those issues, I, I certainly am, um, please join us. And, and that's, we'd love to have more people carrying that work, uh, preparing the ground, initiating opportunities for select with community members. You know, we just, we're expanding our, our nursery. It's called the Nursery Growth Project. And why, why wouldn't we propagate plants? And when people, people buy plants from us at the nursery, why don't we, for example, gift, you know, give, give planting material to, to slow to community, slow to community members. So if you buy a plant at the nursery, we plant a plant at Maplewood Flats and we plant, uh, we offer plants for free to slow to community members. Like there's all kinds of ways that we can, um, you know, we print a, an annual calendar, a fundraising calendar, but we also gift a hundred calendars to slow to elders to, to their annual Christmas, uh, elders lunch. Um, you know, there's just lots of small steps that we can do to kind of normalize the relationship. So if you have ideas, we welcome you to participate in that. Yeah, I, I really enjoy and I learn a lot from these sorts of conversations and uh, I'm really uh, happy to see a lot of younger, younger people here because uh, other, other conversations that we've had is kind of diversifying our membership base from not that there's, there's anything wrong, but um, with the people we have, and we're very grateful for the members we have, but in order to represent um, the wider community, it's, it's great to have this sort of interest. Um, Kai asked if we have a relationship with the LGBTQI slash two-spirit community, and I, I can't really speak to this. I don't know if Leanne or Erwin has has any thoughts on this? We, we haven't, um, Kai, thanks for your question. It's a great question. Um, what we've done, um, you know, coming out of that white supremacist space of um, thinking that there's a particular model, patriarchal, Western scientific capitalist model, um, you know, we're obviously, we're doing work in such a way that is not about virtue signaling or, you know, performative allyship or, um, you know, we're really much more interested in actually the structural changes into our organization. So I think when, it, when we look back at those structural changes, that's work that we're doing. We're doing structural changes um, while we're not necessarily making statements publicly um, on, our, on our materials. This is what we stand for. We're actually trying to emphasize structural changes, um, which means we're, um, Priority, prioritizing recruitment of uh, queer birders. We're, um, we're prioritizing um, inclusive safe spaces so that people can actually feel like that they identify, they can identify with us. Uh, we don't want to tokenize and marginalize participation by quote unquote other communities. So um, it's a, we're definitely in transition in that work. Um, I know that um, we have queer, um, POC birders now in our organization that weren't in our organization before. Um, and I know that because, as I said, when, when I joined the organization, it was an exclusively, almost exclusively uh, heteronormative, uh, white, I think half, half of our, our participant members spoke with a UK, a UK accent. Like it was extremely um, narrow. And in fact, that's, that didn't reflect the participants outside in, on, on the trails and people who enjoyed the site. And so we've really aggressively changed that. 
um, but we're it's still nascent work and still fledgling work. So um, that, that's how I would answer that question. Yeah, like I said, I learn a lot from about the organization and just in general from these conversations. So yeah, thank you for your questions. Um, Rachel asks if about committee meetings and are they held via a Zoom or in person? What day of the week and what time are they usually held? Uh, as far as I know right now, they're just gonna be held over Zoom unless we say otherwise. And as far as the ones that I've been um, in, they've generally been in the evenings when people, or when people are available. But um, yeah, yeah, and, and there's, there's committee in advance usually. There's, yeah, there's committees and there's working groups. So if you if you know like the Iranian event that I curated last week, um, you know I, I asked Leanne to help, I asked Alice to help, and. We just we just jumped in and did it, so that would be a small working group. So you could work with a posse of people, a posse of collaborators, and do like an occasional. We're going to do three events in the next year. We're going to do like a poetry event. We're going to do a film night, and we're going to do a series of walks, and um, and we would support you. And so you could just come up with a proposal, and we would support that. So that's that's blurring the lines between being a volunteer and being a programmer. So we welcome. You know, you might be a university researcher, you might be doing your PhD or your master's, SFU, BCIT, Kaplan or whatever, and you're doing some, you have some objectives to do a term paper or to do a, a capstone. Bring it to us, we'll work with you on your project, you benefit from it, we benefit from it, so, um, and we might even cluster people around you, so if you have an idea, or if you want to like, um, if you want to hook up with um, like, if you want to start a queer birders group or a um, a photo exhibition, or you know, we could work with you and organize help you organize that. So don't feel like you've got to slot into one of our structures, like a monthly programs meeting. In fact, if we're having about 80 volunteers, we actually don't have space for for all those folks on the programs committee. So the program the committees are are kind of unto, unto themselves. But I would really encourage folks to think about working groups and project groups. Mm -hmm. um, or to join our teams like the, the, the nursery growth project just join it you don't have to join a committee just join a join a working group yeah yeah there's a there's a lot of um, opportunities like I said before just if you think you have like a, a, a skill set or if you want to do anything or start a working group yeah just reach out and yeah, we're we're looking we're looking to expand and diversify so if you have these ideas they're great well, if there are no more questions and everyone's satisfied, I think we can end it. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again to Erwin. As always, his his insights are really, really great. And um, and I'm really happy to see the interest today. And thank you, Leanne, for the start and figuring out Zoom and Facebook Live and all that jazz. But yeah, thank you, everyone. And I think we'll end it here. <laughs> Have a great day. <laughs> thank you.